Hey, welcome everybody. Great to see you. Hope you are doing really well. I want to greet everybody at Alamance campus. Let's put our hands together and say we love you everybody at Alamance. We're one church in two locations and uh, they're doing great today. Listen, uh, we just wrapped up uh, our uh, freedom groups. You know, at Grace Church, our vision is to reach people and build lives. We want people to come to know the Lord and have a real relationship with God through Christ. But then we also want to help build people's lives in every aspect, and we do that a lot of different ways. Uh, one of our key ways is in our small groups. We've got lots of different small groups going on in the fall, in the winter, and in, we have summer small groups. Uh, but one that we do is called Freedom Groups. It's a nine-week small group. We actually had 22 Freedom Groups this fall, six of which were out at Alamance campus, which we love. And, um, and, and th- they go through and talk about how we have freedom in our lives we all have gone through stuff, and sometimes we need to forgive, sometimes we need to process, sometimes we need to look. Anyway, it culminates in this weekend, and uh, this weekend, let me, let me get these stats right, we had 135 people participate in freedom groups this semester in 22 groups, and 88 leaders served this weekend. They have, they have a Friday night, Saturday, prayer time, and it's just powerful. Um, over the last six years, 594 people have gone through freedom 137 leaders and co-leaders, and 115 ministry teams. Isn't that just absolutely amazing? Let me give you a little, yeah, yeah, let's give God a hand. This person said, freedom is both redemptive, it redeems things from the past, and victorious. It's different for everyone involved, both participants and leaders grow. This person said, as a leader in freedom, I feel like I'm participating or part of the Great Commission. Making new leaders is a big part of why I love freedom. It's been just a a great way to help produce leaders. I I love this one. I have been set free from the lie that God abandoned me during the most painful, darkest time in my life. I replaced the lie with the truth that he has never left me and been with me by my side. I have been free to forgive those that hurt me, and I've sought forgiveness from those that I have hurt. I feel a peace that only comes with complete surrender. Thank you, Jesus. Let me read one more. Freedom gave me clarity on a lot of things that were giving me fear and anxiety. I was able to speak truth over the power of it and, and, and it had over my life and welcome the Holy Spirit into the future. And so anyway, just want to mention next fall, we do this once a year. So we'll be launching again in the fall. If you've not participated in freedom, maybe the back of your head say next fall, I want to hop in, participate. It really is powerful, life-changing. The groups fill up. Uh, because uh, it's so effective in helping people build their lives, grow in Christ, and make a difference. So, hey everyone, we're in this series right now called Heaven, Living with an Eternal Perspective. Kind of kicked it off last week talking about how Jesus and the Apostle Paul had this really clear view of what heaven was like. And actually, we've never done a series just on heaven before, but having a clear view of eternity and living in light of that perspective doesn't make us so heavenly minded we're no earthly good. It's actually the opposite. It actually helps us be effective. It helps us make an impact. It helps us um, bring change to the world in a positive way. And so um, that's why we're diving into this. I actually mentioned last week, hey, if you have any questions, you know, send some questions about heaven. And uh, you can still do that. We've got a QR code here. Or just go to gracelife.com. And uh, I, I believe we've, uh, I've received now over 150 questions. <laughs> and so next week, I'm going to dive in. I'm going to try to answer 150 questions. Not really. Um, but I'm going to answer as many as I can. And if you want to send one in, it'll help to know, like, where do people have the most questions. And, you know, we'll talk about, you know, like your pet. And uh, one that I've been asked a couple times is, is there golf in heaven? And so... Uh, We'll, we're we're going to circle back and talk about that. And so uh, anyway, feel free to send in a question still. Uh, and next week, the whole time, all I'm going to do is answer questions. It's going to be kind of fun, I think. So I'll do my best. Um, anyway, today we're going to answer this question. What happens after you die? What happens after you die? Now, I've only been, I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but I've been with one person as they passed away. It was actually a member of Grace Church. The family was there and... Um, uh, this gentleman was on hospice care, and, and we, we sang, and we read scripture, and we prayed, and it was a really sweet moment, and uh, he, he, he was there with us in this bed, and, and, and then all of a sudden, I realized, he's gone. He didn't, 
he didn't just quit breathing. What was amazing, it was a profound experience for me. I sat there and I looked and I went, oh, he's gone. Like, he's not here. He was there in this body. And all suddenly, like, he went to be with the Lord. And like that, I was like, it, I, I just sat there and realized this, this is now an empty shell, this body. And, and, and I sat there realizing he's, he still exists. We are going to live forever, but he's not here anymore. That's now just a sack of chemicals in some sense, right? He's gone. And it, I, it was really profound experience. And, and the truth of it is this. You are a spirit. You have a soul. And you live in a body. You are a spirit. That's who you are. And, and you have a soul. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. And your personality and all that. But you live in a body. And at one point for all of us, one day our bodies will expire. It's, it's kind of batting 100% success rate, right? And what happens to us after we die. I'll be honest, in my journey, I really wrestled with these questions before I came to faith of like, okay, what happens when you die? And who makes it to heaven? And who doesn't make it to heaven? And, you know, I, I, I really struggled. In fact, you know, if we had to uh, send in a question to pastor, um, I had the same question that I asked uh, in college, not to be argumentative, but I was sincerely asking this question, which was, uh, how could God send Gandhi to hell? Like, a good person. Like, how could a loving God send a good, you know, in my mind, like a good person to hell away from the Lord? Like, I just couldn't figure that out. And I, I would talk to my young life leader from high school. I talked to this pastor and stayed after church one time, and I just was... You know, one time I came home uh, from college, and I was, again, I was trying to, like, figure this all out, and, 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 and I needed to get my hair cut. So my sister said, well, why don't you go get your, your hair cut your, by this guy that cuts my hair downtown store? So I'm like, okay. So I went down, you know, I was getting my hair cut, and I just sit down in the chair, and this guy, Monty, Monty Marino, he's a, a, a Italian. Um, he had grown up on the street. It was a tough boxer, been in the gang. Like, you know, he was really, and he gave his life to the Lord. So I sit down, and the first thing he says, he goes, well, you know those two subjects you're not supposed to ever talk about, religion and politics? He goes, those are my two favorite subjects to talk about. And I'm like, okay. And so he kind of goes, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, I'll go with religion, you know. And so, you know, y'all have to, let me give you just quick background. I am Scandinavian. I grew up in a denomination where we're, we're just really, you know, we don't have bands and, you know, like you sit in the pew and we're... You, you know, we're, we're, we're chill, you know, we're Scandinavian, you know. We don't have a whole lot of personality, you know. Um, and uh, so that's my experience. So we started talking, and, and, and he's Italian, and he's got, like, a lot of personality, you know. And, 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 like, we think about God, but we don't really, you know what I'm saying? We don't really do a whole lot, you know. Anyway, so we started talking, da, 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 and, 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 and he's just, like, so fired up. And I'm like, whoa, you know. Anyway, at one point, he got really fired up, and, and he would... Uh, he would quit, like, cutting my hair for long sections of time, right? Like, <laughs> like, like whatever, 20, 30 minutes. Literally turned it, I, I looked at my watch. It was like an hour and a half I was there. Like, he would just quit and then just, like, preach to me. And, and again, I am, like, reserved. I am Nor Norwegian, you know? And so at one point, he started, he, go, he goes, you know, the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And I had a vision. I go, I don't even know what you're talking about, you know? Us, like, our denomination, we don't do visions, you know? And, and, and he goes, and so what happened is he goes, I, I, I was at the, the, like the pearly gates or whatever, and the, and the doors open, the lights shone, and, and he literally does this. He gets down, and he goes, and he's got his scissors in one hand, and he's got his comb in the other. He goes, so my knee bowed, my tongue was confessing Jesus Christ. I'm going, oh, my God, you know, like, I was like, get this hair cut over. Like, you know, like, I got to get out of here. Like, oh, yeah. And so anyway, we, we got to the point where I finally asked him, I said, okay, I said, Monty, I said, I just got one question for you that I'm really struggling with, is, is, is how could God send Gandhi to hell? I said, I just don't get that. And he goes, Gandhi? I don't even know who Gandhi is, but I'll tell you this much, if he didn't accept Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, he's burning in hell. And I'm like, ah, you know, I go, you don't even know who Gandhi is? Whatever, Okay. And my intellectual mind, I'm like, you are so offensive. I left there so mad, so angry. Like, I was just, like, not happy, Bob. And eventually I got some answers that were maybe a little more helpful. We'll 
circle back to that. But we're going to launch today from Luke chapter 16. And uh, I just wanted you all to hear my story a little bit. Anyway, um, you're like, I can't believe you turned into a pastor, you know. Um, and, and, and here's Luke chapter 16. Um, Jesus, I-, I wanted to give you the whole context because it's so fascinating. But he's talking with these Pharisees. And basically, they justify themselves. And he's trying to get clarity that, like, basically everyone needs forgiveness and grace. So he tells them this story. He said there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, we don't know the rich man's name, but we do know the poor man, the beggar's name, Lazarus. And so here's Lazarus. He's at the gate. Um, he's just longing to eat anything that would fall from the table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. What happens after you die? Well, the angels came and carried Lazarus to heaven, to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus, By his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Now, Again, let me just say this. When we read the Bible, by the way, let me just say I'm real excited. At the new year, we're going to do a really exciting series about loving the word, reading the word, learning the word, living the word. But if you look at just this, if you, if you pull out just one verse, you say, what, what, does like rich people go to hell and poor people go to heaven? But there's more to this. Let's keep tracking with this, okay? Here we go. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Notice this fact. The rich man doesn't argue, hey, this isn't fair. I feel like I'm getting ripped off. I don't deserve this. No one's going to say that in eternity, that something wasn't fair. God is just. So anyway, but he says, hey, send someone to warn them. And and, and Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Now notice that. He, He didn't say, if someone from the dead comes and tells them, hey, start doing more good things, start sharing your food with the beggar out front. Like he didn't say that. He said, this is how he knew he didn't repent and own and ask for forgiveness and put his trust in the Lord. That is the issue. Repentance and faith towards God. It's not being a a good person or a better person or getting your good stuff to outweigh your bad stuff. That's what he said. But if someone goes to them, then they will repent. If someone would rise from the dead. Now check out this response that Jesus is telling the story. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets... They will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now, check out this. Jesus is telling the story. He's sharing this parable. And who would be the one that would eventually rise from the dead and that we would celebrate it every Easter? It would be Jesus Christ. And even now, even when someone has risen from the dead, which is Jesus, he goes, he goes, even that won't necessarily convince people that they need to repent and trust in God. Because even if he's risen from the dead, not everyone is going to believe. Not everyone is going to trust him. Not everyone is going to bow their knee and, and, and trust and, and, and repent and give their lives to Jesus Christ. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that after you die, people go to one of two places. And, and, and there's no crossing over from one to the other. And you don't get a second chance. Repentance and faith in God is what determines our eternal destination. What did Jesus not teach? What did Jesus not teach? He did not teach this in any place. 
that good people go to a good place when they die. Now, this is the most common thought that people have about heaven, is that good people go to a good place when they die. If you ask people, hey, when you die, you think you'll go to heaven? A common answer is, I hope so. I think so. I mean, I don't know. And then if you ask somebody, hey, well, why would God let you into heaven? How are you going to get in? Well, I mean, I think I've been a good person. I, I, I've really tried to do good. I think hopefully my good stuff would outweigh my bad stuff. I think God would look at my heart and my intentions, and I'm really trying to be a good person. Andy Stanley wrote a short little book. If you're, if you're fascinated by this topic, it is the best explanation that I've ever read on why this isn't true. And the title of his book says it all. Since no one's perfect, how good is good enough? Since no one's perfect, which I think is pretty clear, how good is good enough? Like, how good do you need to be? If good people go to a good place when you die, then where are you at? How good is good enough? Like, if, if, if there's a good meter, and, and number one, it's kind of hard to measure where you're at, which is a little unnerving, right? It means that nobody knows, like, really where they stand. And then how many, like, if you do a bad thing, how many good things do you need to make up? And then how bad is the bad? And do, do we rank it 1 to 10? Is there a point system that we're kind of calculating as we go? And, and, and you know, like, like where does this, it, it, it actually, if, if you put um, just logic to this, it's really hard to determine how you would get in and where you're at, much less if you apply the Bible and what the Bible teaches, the Bible never teaches that, that good people go to a good place when they die. It, it, it actually teaches that forgiven people go to a good place when you die. Forgiven people, not good people, forgiven people go to heaven. Entrance isn't based upon doing good, doing better than others. Here's the other problem with this, is that if this was true, then you'd get to heaven and you'd say, thank you very much. I'm just better than y'all that didn't make it. Because you'd have earned it by getting your good stuff, and there'd be people that made it that would go like, well, I'm just a better person than you. Sorry you didn't make it. <laughs> Let me tell you this. No one is going to be self-congratulating and patting themselves on the back when they get to heaven. No one's going to look down on anyone else because the way that I like to say it is the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And the Bible and Jesus never taught that good people go to a good place. Forgiven people go to a good place. Now, let me tell you what else Jesus didn't teach. I'll give you a couple others. This is annihilationism, which means you're annihilated when you die. So that, like, good people go to a good place when they die, but bad people just don't exist. They're annihilated, and they cease to exist. The Bible also does not teach that. Let me tell you what it also doesn't teach, which is ultimate reconciliation. Ultimate reconciliation or universalism is that ultimately everyone ends up in a better place, in a good place. Everyone makes it one way or another. And, and, and it's so, you know, some people would, would believe, well, the, the bad people, they just get annihilated. Or, uh, you know, ultimate reconciliation, somehow we all kind of get there. Which kind of is turned into, uh, tied into this, which also Jesus did not teach, which is purgatory. That purgatory is this place where, like, if you're like a like kind of in the middle of the road, you're not really good and you're not super bad, but you can get in purgatory and you can kind of do your time. It's a place of cleansing and you're, you're, you're in the middle and you're kind of uh, working it out. And that thought of purgatory, which um, is not in the Bible, you'll never find the concept or the word in the Bible, um, led to things like praying for the dead or indulgences where people would pay to try to get their relatives out of purgatory and into heaven. And um, that is also something that um, Jesus never taught. And the last one I'll give you is deconstructionism. Um, Jesus never taught to deconstruct what the Baptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Episcopalians, the Catholics, um, like people have been teaching straight up the road uh, deconstruction just means tearing down the foundations of the faith that have been believed by followers of Christ for hundreds and hundreds of years. So um, let me give you a, a quote from Bertrand Russell. He said this. Um, he, this is from his essay, Why I Am Not a Christian. He said, there's one very serious defect, to my mind, in Christ's moral character. 
And it is that he believed in hell. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. One does find repeatedly a vindictive fury against those people who would not listen to his teaching. I must say that I think all this doctrine, that hellfire is a punishment for sin, is a doctrine of cruelty. So what is he saying? He's saying, hey, I think there's a defect in Christ's moral character, and I'm going to stand and judge him. I don't think that a loving God could send people to hell and, and, and punish people. And so um, I think um, I have moral superiority, and I know the defect in Christ's character. Now, that's pretty strong, you know, like if, if, if you want to sit in judgment of uh, Christ's character. But let me just say this. One thing that he really got correct is that Jesus believed in hell uh, and talked about it. And, and, and if some people will say this, well, I don't believe in all this hell th- stuff. I like the red letters. I like the teachings of Jesus. Love your neighbor. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and be kind. Go the extra mile. Turn the other cheek. Those are the, like, I like to just stick with the red letters. Well, uh, you know, the red letters are like some Bibles will put the red letters, the, the, the exact quotes of Jesus in red. And so they like, oh, I like the red letters. I go, okay, great. If you like the red letters, then buckle up is what I like to say. Because actually, what we're going to look at here, I could go to 13 different places, but I thought I might as well go to the most well-known place, which is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, the most famous sermon ever given by Jesus, red letters, what he taught. And, and what Bertrand Russell had really clear was that actually Jesus did believe in hell. And, and, and let's just track with that thought for a minute. Jesus said this, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, if you're even angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you're in danger of the fires of hell. Now you go, oof, that seems kind of strong. I I think this is what Jesus is doing. He's saying, hey, what happens is this, is we tend to go, oh, those are the really bad people that murder people, and I'm going to look down my nose and think I'm morally superior to them. And what Jesus was really trying to do is lead everyone to realize that they need forgiveness, they need grace. At one time, there's a story where where the people came and said, hey, Jesus, these people, there was this tower of Siloam that fell on these people, and, and who sinned? Was it them or their parents? Like, why? Who messed up? Obviously, they're getting judged by God because this tower fell on them. And Jesus was like, whoa, y'all don't get this. And he actually said this, unless you too repent, you will likewise perish. What he was saying is this, is you're not morally superior to other people. And I think what Jesus was doing in the Sermon on the Mount is he was going from external obedience to internal. He goes, hey, I'm not looking for you just to be nice on the outside. He said like the the Pharisees, he called them whitewashed tombs. He goes, you're all white on the outside, but on the inside, he goes, you're dead. On the inside, and he goes, what I'm trying to do is lead you to realize that we all need grace. We all need forgiveness. We all need, and and, and so that's what he's doing here Uh, and, and, and talking about this. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so he's trying to say, hey, listen, it's not just the external, it's the internal. It's your heart. It's your thoughts that really matter. And then he he goes on and says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it's better for you to lose one of the members than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And I don't think he was literally saying, hey, I think this is how you get rid of your issue with lust, is to poke out an eye, because it's actually a heart issue. But what he was saying is this, that the weight of what we do with the Lord really matters in our eternal destination and, and that our heart intentions uh, that are secret are just as important as those that are public. And, and he, he was trying to help them feel the weight of that. 
And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. Again, he's not saying literally cut off your hand. Then you won't sin anymore. But he is saying feel the weight that, that there is um, this eternal um, uh, destination. L- let me give you one more. This is also Sermon on the Mount. More Sermon on the Mount, y'all. Um, ooh, ooh, red letters. Aren't you glad, y'all? Uh, let me just say this. Well, I'm going to get to it in just a minute. Y'all like, what church did we show up at this Sunday? You know, like, I could have swore we drove into Grace Church and Pastor Kendrick, nice guy, you know. Anyway, listen to Jesus here. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's not just about verbally confessing I'm a Christian. It's about internally being transformed. And when you are internally transformed, it shows up in your life. See, I think that was the problem with the rich man. He was never internally, he was never repented. He was never internally transformed. And so it never showed up with sharing. Caring for the poor and the needy. He goes, he goes, it's not caring for the poor and the needy that gets you into heaven. It's the internal transformation that does, but it will show up in your life. And I think that's what he's saying here. Um, not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord. And, and, and so he says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? Like, we did all these things for you, Lord. And... and uh, and, and, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of, check this out, lawlessness. Is that you're not under the leadership of God, of Christ. He said, follow me. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I want you to follow my leadership. And, and actually, you haven't been following my leadership and having a relationship. I never knew you. The relationship we're meant to have with God in Christ is he leads and we follow. Follow me. And, and, and in that place of surrender. And, and I, I was to say this as your pastor, and I love you, is, is one thing I'm very passionate about is, is, is we want to make it hard for people to go to hell in our city. <laughs> we want to make, make it very clear on what it means to know Christ, to follow Christ, to have a relationship with Christ. Every week we give an invitation for people to come to know Christ. And I feel the weight of this that I, that I know. Listen, Paul got this. Paul was very clear like, um, very clear, like he had a responsibility to help people realize that, that there's two sides of the coin. We really get mercy when we also realize there's judgment. We get the bad news and the good news. Listen to what Paul said to the, at the end of his life, near the end of his life, to the elders in Ephesus. He was on a ship, and he'd stop in and talk to him. He says, therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Not just one side. I love the Grace Church. Listen, I'm in Egram 7. I'm happy. I like fun. I like grace. Okay? Woo-hoo-hoo-hoo. All right? But it's unhealthy for any of us to only have one side without the other. If we don't have, like, like, like who God is on both sides. So he goes, I'm going to declare to you the whole counsel. So check this out. Guard yourselves. And God's people, feed and shepherd God's flock, his church purchased with his own blood over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. And he says, that's what I'm going to do, is is I I, I, I want you to really see the fullness of who God is. Now, this is what really helped me. What helped me? My perspective was this. How could a loving God send a good person to hell? And what helped me was when I interviewed a pastor And he helped me see two things that I did not see properly. And the two things that he helped me see were the character of God and the character of people, particularly me. And what I mean by that is, first of all, the character of God is that God's character is kind and loving and gracious. And Jesus would, like, take children up in his lap and he'd forgive. He was so, like, humble and gentle, like, Those that were sinners, he was a friend of sinners. They felt comfortable around him. I think they felt loved. They felt accepted. But that same Jesus that was gentle and kind and was like the Lamb of God was also a lion and a lamb. 
And that same Jesus also, the Bible said, made for himself a cord with whips, and he went into the temple to the money changers that were taking advantage of people financially and ripping them off and making money off of their um, worship. And he came and he starts turning over tables and like driving out the money changers. And I go, that's a little different view. That's not cuddly Jesus. And, and, and the truth is this, God's character is also righteous and holy and pure. And he's just He's perfectly balanced in both. He's full of both characteristics. He's full of grace and full of truth. He's 100% grace and he's 100% truth. And and, and, and there's this other side, like the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And God hates evil and injustice. And and, and he's a just, right God. We don't, let me just say this. We don't want a God that isn't just, right? We want a God that's going to hold Rapists and murderers and human traffickers and like real, bad people. We want we, we want them held accountable. Y'all agree? Like you know, we don't want a guy to go. Ah, don't worry about it. No big deal. No, 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 no. We but 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 here's the problem. I want the really bad guys to get it, but I think I'm a pretty good guy. And what? What, the, what this pastor helped me see is, is, is this, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And, 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 and here's the light that went on for me. Is I was comparing myself to the murderer, the rapist, the really bad guys. And I go, I think I'm a pretty good person. If I compare myself with them, I think I'm in there somewhere. But if, if all of a sudden I'm falling short of the glory of God. And so what this pastor helped me do is he goes, Kendrick, so he, we started walking through. Like, he goes, have you ever sinned? I'm like, yeah, yeah of course, you know. Like, and, and, and we won't take the time to do it, but we will kind of walk through. Like, okay, how did you do on commandment one? You know, there's ten commandments. And by the time we got done, I realized I was 0 for 10. I've broken all of them. Let me just say this. I believe every single person on planet Earth has broken all Ten Commandments, not some of them. We're all 0 for 10. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the penalty of our sin, is what he told me, is proportional to the person we sin against. So here I was 0 for 10, okay? And, and um, I, I sinned against this God who is holy and pure and just. David said this. David, you know, King David, you know, we love David, good, great guy. Um, he also committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, murdered. And in Psalm 51, when he, when he is kind of repenting for his sin, he says, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Now, that's amazing to me. How could David, I go, David, against you and you alone have you sinned? I'm going, no, 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 David. What about Uriah? What about Bathsheba? What about the family? And the, like, like you, you didn't sin just against the Lord. But I think what he's saying is this, in comparison, he goes, I realize that when I compare myself to God, that I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and who he is. And my righteous and good maker who loves me, who cares for me, who like made me in his image. He goes, the biggest issue I have to make right is with the Lord. The biggest issue I have. Now, I need to make things right with people. I think we do, and we should. Own it, take responsibility, ask for forgiveness. He goes, but it's a way bigger issue that, that I have when I stand before God. And a light went on for me that, that, that I would stand before God and give an account for my life. And I realized that I was imperfect, and I'd fallen short, and I had sinned. And, and I realized instead of asking, like, how could a loving God send a good person to hell, I realize I'm probably not as quite of a good person as I think I am. And maybe if we look at this not from like Bertrand Russell, I'm going to judge Christ, and I think I'm going to tell him where his character defect is. But what if we looked at this from God's perspective, not my perspective? Then if I look at it from God's perspective, maybe a much better question would be, how could a holy, pure God allow anyone into heaven? Right? Like, like I realize, wait a minute. God doesn't owe us anything. We're the ones who mess this up. We're the ones who disobeyed his, like he set up these loving 
laws and ways for us to have love. And, and we're down here, and we're saying thanks but no thanks, lawlessness. I don't want to be in your kingdom. I like to do this my way. I like to go. And, 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 and then the pain and the heartache, and we just create this big, huge mess, and it's broken, and it's unjust, and there's, you know, like all the devastation and pain that we experience on planet Earth. That's not God's fault. That's our fault. And God could have just said, well, sorry, y'all. Eat the consequences of what you have sown, and uh, y'all messed up. Get after it. You didn't want my leadership. Go get them. But he didn't. I mean, he, he, God could have been, like, you couldn't have said something negative about God if he had chosen to do nothing and said, well, y'all made a decision. Live with it. In fact, we have the pain, the brokenness, all the terrible bad stuff. And he goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come from heaven to earth. I'm going to live a sinless life. And y'all are due, the wages of sin is death. There's a penalty for disobeying a holy, pure God. And instead of like letting you all just eat the consequences of that yourself, I am going to die on a cross and I'm going to absorb upon myself the penalty that's due every single human being on planet earth for all time and absorb the wrath of God, the anger of God, the justice of God. It actually said about people in the Old Testament that God passed over former sins and that actually in Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, God forgave them, but there could have been an accusation against him that he wasn't just because they're like, why did they get forgiven? Well, it was because of the cross of Christ. And Jesus Christ died on a cross. He shed his blood. He took upon himself the very penalty that was due you and me for our disobedience, for our not following the Lord, for our not doing what God wants. And, 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 and then he rises from the dead to prove this and, and then as if someone rose from the dead. And then he says, hey, I'm going to give you an offer, a free gift, an opportunity to receive Christ and forgiveness and grace. Here you go. Like, I did it all for you. And you have an opportunity to bow your knee and confess with your tongue. Do I need to earn it? How, like, do I need to get my good stuff? No, 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 no. It's for everybody. It's for every tongue, tribe, and nation, and people group of the world. I did this for you. Here's a free offer. Pretty stunning. And then for us to say, you know. So in that interview with that pastor, he said, well, Kenneth, would you like to give your life to Christ? And I, and I remember thinking like, in the back of my head, I'm like, I'm not letting anybody talk me into anything. Like, I just didn't want to make a decision. And I know it's kind of rebellious. I'm sorry. Uh, but, but like, I'm like, I'm not getting, I'm not going to get pressured just in the moment. You know what I'm saying? I want to make this decision. And I don't want to get, like, I, like, I'm not doing this for you. Like, I don't know. I just didn't want to get pressured. Maybe I was still recovering in, 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 in from the hairdresser that, you know, let me have it. Anyway. He said, well, 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 why wouldn't you? And I go, I don't know. I said, I'll, I'll, okay, since we're being transparent and open here, I'll be honest. I said, like in a week, we got spring break. We're going down to Padre Island to party for the week. I said, I'll be honest. Like, you know, I'm just being transparent, you know. He goes, and he goes well, Kenrick. And, and, and again, this is the nicest gentleman. But he, let, he was helping me see the weight of eternity that's very, very real. And he just put it in perspective. He goes, well, Kenrick, he goes, what if you go down to Padre Island, have a great time, party with your friends all week, you're driving back home, and, you know, Midwest, we get snowstorms, and I don't know, you, you get in a car accident and, or semi, whatever, and all of a sudden you die. I mean, every day is a gift. You never know for sure. And all of a sudden you stand before the Lord, and we've talked about you're really clear that you've sinned, and uh, you, you know that you've fallen short, and, 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 and you also know that Christ died, shed his blood, paid a price, gave you an offer, a free gift of salvation. He said, you can receive Christ and forgiveness for sins for all of eternity be with God. And, and, and he said, I mean, God's heart would just be broken that he did this and loved you and, like, gave you the opportunity. And, and just, it was, like, so clear and so simple. You just had to humble yourself and ask him for forgiveness and grace. But then you choose not to, and then you get to live with that choice for all of eternity. He goes, but I'll say this, at least when you're in hell for all of eternity, you could say you had a good week at Padre Island. I'm like, <laughs> good point. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. What happens when we die? When we die, we're going to stand before God. Look at Hebrews 9, 27 says this. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, 
to face judgment. That's going to be true for all of us. When we, when we die, we'll stand before God and give an account for our lives. And the Bible is very clear. Let me just say this. This may be new for you, is that there's two judgments. There's a great white throne judgment, and then there's the judgment seat of Christ. Now, let me explain these to you because this is very important. Sometimes we talk about judgments and, you know. One, the great white throne, we're all going to stand, and um, the, the great white throne is, is, is a throne for faith. When we stand before God, each of our lives will be laid out, and we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. And there is an advocate, Jesus Christ, who died, shed his blood, and he says, I will be your advocate. I will stand in your place. I will be the propitiation for your sins. I will, I, I will not only forgive you, but be your righteousness. And, and, and at that great white throne, God will separate not the good from the bad, but the forgiven from the, those that chose to live without Christ and to reject his offer. And uh, um, you, you can read Revelation 20, 11 to 15, is that about the great white throne. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And for me, that happened after that interview with that pastor. I was walking back. Um, I parked my uh, friend's car that I'd borrowed. Like, you know, the students have to park out in the boonies. <laughs> and I was walking back to campus. And where the student parking is, he had to walk across the football field. So I'm walking across the football field, and I just had this thought driving back. I thought, in my head I was thinking, i got more questions. You know, when I get back from partying for the week, I'm going to, you know, get serious about this. I just had this thought that I knew enough to make a decision. And I, I was like, okay, I'm going for it. And I could walk you to the very spot on the 20-yard line, home side of the field, <laughs> towards campus, I knelt down, and I prayed, Lord, I want to live for you. Forgive me. I know I've sinned. Christ, come into my heart. Come into my life. I choose you. I want to live for you all the days of my life. And I stood up, and by the grace of God, I knew I was forgiven, and I knew that it was real. And I knew, like, I got to tell somebody, like, this is crazy. Like, it's, you know. And I had one friend who went to chapel once in a while. It was like the most religious person I knew. Like, I'm calling him, you know. And I went, splat! Guess what happened? Ah! And, and he's like, okay. You know, anyway, a little bit much. Now, let me see. The second judgment is this, the judgment seat of Christ, where God will judge us according to what we've done for him. Let me read this to you. First Corinthians, Paul says this. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation, the solid rock, the one who forgives us, adopts us into his family. And then check this out. It says this, if anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hair, stubble. So there's these building materials. Some are straw, hair, wood. Some are like silver and gold and costly stones. What what does he mean by this? Well, the next verse tells us their work will be shown for what it is because the day, the great and terrible day of the Lord, when Christ returns, will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. So when Christ returns, here's the second judgment. He's going to test the quality of your work. Did you do it for the Lord because you cared for people? Or were you being nice at work just because you were insecure and you didn't want anybody to not like you? It's going to test our work a little bit. We're going to find out the quality of it. Now, um, if what's been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. The judgment seat of Christ is all about giving out rewards for how we serve Christ. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Like this is the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross lived his life, not really for the Lord, but on the cross. Moments before he passed away, he acknowledged Christ and, and, and said, hey, we're getting what we deserve. He's not getting what he's deserved. One thief cursed Christ. The other acknowledged him and honored him. And, and Jesus turned to him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. And I think he didn't have a whole lot of time to store up a lot of treasures in heaven. Although I will say this, maybe that one confession led a lot of people to Christ. We'll see how he gets rewarded. But that's what the judgment seat of Christ is about, is that we are rewarded I believe in a stunning way for everything that we do at Christ. Now, let me just say, when you die, you're going to stand before the judgment seat to say, hey, do you have faith in Christ? 
Are you forgiven? Have you repented? Have you put Christ first? Have you received his work? And the second judgment seat is really going to be fun. It's going to be stunning and amazing. Let me give you some examples. It says here in Matthew, don't store for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, okay? Rather, store for yourselves treasures in heaven, okay? Um, In Matthew 10, it says, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. They will be rewarded. Now, let me read, this is fascinating, Matthew 25, more red letters, Jesus is teaching this. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, when Christ returns, and the angels are with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Oh, come on, let's go, let's go. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. This is the eternity, this is heaven. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And, And then the righteous will answer, Lord, When did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? Lord, when did we see you a stranger invite you in, or needing clothes and close you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will then reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Let me tell you what's going to happen to you. When you get to heaven, and if you have faith in Jesus Christ, You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And let me tell you, you are going to be stunned at the reward system. And you're going to go, when did I do that? When did I send that text? When did I serve? When did I go over to that person's house? When did I help? And let me tell you this. You don't have to fulfill anyone else's calling and destiny. You just need to do what God's called you to do. And the reward system, I think, is going to be stunning. Jesus said this. Actually, whatever you give up for like a, a family of houses for my sake on this earth, you'll receive a hundredfold. And in heaven, eternal life will be even better. The reward system is shocking. And let me tell you this. It doesn't matter how popular you are, how many likes or followers or big of an influence you are. It doesn't matter if you're on a platform or if you're like, like it just matters that you are who you are. Thursday night, at service, I, I was talking about this, and I looked over here, and there's a gentleman, his name's Alan. And I just, like, it wasn't, again, not in the notes, but I said, I said, Alan, y'all, let me just tell you this, Alan, for 25 years, he went to New Hope Elementary School because if he had some pretty rough growing up, some pretty traumatic stuff, and he said, I don't want any particularly young boys, to experience what I did. He goes, I'm going to serve and, uh, in, as a volunteer for 25 years. And he always found the one or two kids that he felt was most vulnerable. In particular, he made sure they all knew how to read. Literacy is the greatest correlator between success or not success in life. And he showed up for 25 years. I'm bragging about him. He'll never tell you this. Let me just tell you this. When Alan comes before the judgment seat of Christ, you know what's going to happen? They're going to go, ah, ladies and gentlemen, ah, ah. the place is going to go crazy. He's going, when did I do that? When you helped that kid read. When you told him you were proud of him. Over and over and over and over and over. Let me tell you this. Our life here is but a blink. It's but a moment. And that which is hidden is going to be revealed. And there's going to be a lot of people across this globe that nobody's heard of, that nobody, you know what I'm saying? It's going to be stunning what's going to happen. Your life matters. Your life matters. Let me read you. Can you pull up Revelation? Let me read you the last words of Jesus. Uh, Revelation 22. Look, these are his last words that Jesus said. In the last book of the Bible, last chapter, last page, Look, 
I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to each person according to what they've done. As a follower of Christ, I tell you, that's really, really, really good news. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Y'all said you like to write letters, right? Oof. He's, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And then he says, I am coming soon. Let me just, I want to pray with you and for you here. Everyone, and now, man, I want to pray with you and for you. Let me just say this. I understand this, I think, is one of the most challenging truths, challenging messages to give, challenging realities. There is an eternity, and God is just, and he's righteous, and he's holy, and he's pure, and he's gentle, and he's kind, and he's forgiving. And Jesus Christ loves you. And he cares for you. I don't know about you, but I tell you, the light went on for me when I flipped the script. And I wasn't judging God's character, but I was trusting that he's a good God. Tomorrow, next week, we're going to talk more about this and sorting it out a little bit. Let me tell you this. God offers you his love and grace. And we're appointed to live once and then die. We're each going to stand before the Lord. There's no greater desire that I have for you than that you would know Jesus Christ and his forgiveness and his grace. I know it can be offensive to our intellectual, brilliant minds. And I, the, 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 the gospel and the good news is so simple. It's so straightforward. It, it, it actually, it, it humbles us that we have to say, I need forgiveness. I need, it's, I'm actually not a good person. I'm a sinner like everybody else. And actually, none of us deserve heaven and eternity with God. We all deserve judgment, and Christ paid that judgment. He took upon himself the penalty that was due you and me and for our sin, and he offers us that free gift. And I want to say today, Wouldn't it be awesome if today was the day that you bowed your knee and confessed with your tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord? But right now, we we want to do that. We just want to thank you. You so loved the world that you gave your one and only son. That whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, but have eternal life. Right now, you can just say, Lord, come into my life. I want to live for you. Forgive me. I know I'm a sinner. I want to put you first. I want to follow you. I don't want to stand before you and say, Lord, Lord, I never knew you. I, I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I want to put you first in my life. I want to speak a blessing over you today as you confess that every single time you pray that prayer, God hears it. And I want to encourage everyone here that if you prayed that prayer sincerely from your heart, confessed with your tongue and believed in your heart, you know that you did it. Let me tell you this. John said this, I write these things that you might know that you have eternal life, not hope or think. And the enemy will come and, and sometimes lie in our, in our ear and say, well, I don't even know. Is that even real? You're still kind of a mess up. Yep, I'm still a mess up. And I'm forgiven by Jesus. And I, I, I also want you to be able to shut the voice of the accuser and to know that you're called by God to store up treasures on in heaven and make an impact. Your life matters. Your generosity, your kindness, your encouragement, your serving, your storing up in eternity that God's going to lavishly reward you. And when they announce your name, you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be stunned at the reward. You're going to be stunned at the significance of your life and what you did for the Lord. Father, we love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we put our hands together?